In this video, I'm going to show you one of my favorite strategies you can use to grow a small option trading account. When you're starting out with a small option trading account, it's very important that you have a list of rules and strategies you can use to grow that account. You simply don't want a strategy that could destroy your account. In this video, I'm going to share with you one of my favorite strategies I use. Even though I have a larger account, it's one I've used since I started trading options over 20 years ago. Here are three important things to keep in mind when you're starting out trading options with a small account. First, you want a strategy that can be consistently profitable. You want a strategy that help you to build confidence in your option trading, and it does that because it's a strategy that's simple and easy to understand. Even though the title of this video is how to grow a small account, these techniques and strategies are vital whether you have a small account or a large account. In fact, even though I have a larger trading account today, these are the same strategies I use to this day. Let's first lay kind of the foundation of this video. What exactly do you need to have to start the minimal or smallest option trading account possible? Here you see three things. First of all, you need to have at least a level three option trading approval with your broker. You need to have at least a minimum $2,000 set aside for this option trading account. Now that you're having a nice start by watching this video on how to grow a small account, after this video is over, you wanna continue your education. So these are the basic things you need when you're starting out with a small option trading account. Now let's dig into one of my favorite option strategies. In fact, it's one I've used when I had a small account, but I still use it today even though I have a larger account. As you know, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know I always share examples of real life trades that I've done. So here you see not only my trading strategy I'm going to share with you in this video, but also a trade I did using that strategy. The strategy I'm going to share with you in this video that I like to use in growing any account is a credit spread. Here you see a real life trade I did an HPQ using a bullish put credit spread. We're going to use this trade as we talk through this strategy in this video. Here you see the trade structure. We sell to open a put credit spread below where the market's currently trading at. Here you see the daily chart of HPQ. Where you see this yellow arrow up here, that's April 2nd, the day we did this bullish put credit spread. Notice the HPQ was trading for around $30 per share down to $29.5 per share. With it trading for around $30 per share, we sold to open the HPQ May 17th, $29 put option. As you see here, we did this trade on April 2nd. So that option expired in about a month and a half. To turn this into a spread and not just a naked or cash care put option, we bought to open the HPQ, same expiration day, May 17th, $25 put option. For this overall trade, we put net cash into our pocket of 50 cents per share. There's several reasons why I like doing spreads. First of all, notice that we've capped our loss. The max we can lose here is the difference between the put option we sold of $29 per share and the one we bought of $25 per share or $4 per share minus the 50 cents per share we received. So in this real life example of this bullish put credit spread we did, our max loss will be $3.50 per share. So for each contract, since one contract is equivalent to 100 shares worth, we have a max loss of $350 per contract. Let me show you that here on the chart. You see HPQ was trading for around $30 per share on the day we did this trade. We sold this $29 put option. That meant that we really wouldn't get in trouble unless HPQ traded below $29 per share. And that's if we were in that at expiration. Since we received 50 cents per share for selling that bullish put credit spread, our break even was right down here at $28.50 per share. So we truly wouldn't experience any losses if we're in this position at expiration unless HPQ was below $28.50 per share at expiration. One thing we'll talk about a little bit more later in this video is picking your protective put option strike price. I felt comfortable buying my protected put option pretty far out of the money. Notice here that the protected put option we bought was at that $25 strike price. So it's pretty far away from where HPQ was trading at. I felt comfortable buying that protected put option so far out of the money because my plan for this trade was that if HPQ declined, I was actually going to let it be assigned to me and turn it into a covered call. But if you have a small account, you probably don't want to do that. If that's the case, then you might want to buy your protected put option a lot higher than I did. In fact, you might consider buying the $28 protected put option or $27 protected put option. And that really is dependent on your risk tolerance. And I'll share with you what you have at risk a little more in just a minute. So here you see a recap of our risk. We sold the $29 put option. We received 50 cents for selling that credit spread. That meant that our break even was $28.50. If the stock declined to our protected put option at the $25 strike price, and we were in this position through expiration, we'd be showing a loss of $3.50 per share. So you always wanna know what you have at risk anytime you place an option trade. And with this trade that I did, since we sold two of these credit spread contracts, apply that $3.50 times two, times the 100 shares worth that each contract represents. So our maximum potential loss with this trade I'm sharing with you here 
is $700. Let's run those numbers again using different strike prices. Let's say you again sold the $29 put option. But let's say instead of buying the $25 protected put option, let's say you bought the $27 protected put option. That would mean you'd have $2 at risk as compared to $4 at risk. Let's say for example, for that spread that you receive 25 cents per share. Well, that would mean you'd have $1.75 per share at risk for that bullish put credit spread. Multiply that times the 100 shares worth that each contract represents. And if you did one of those bullish put credit spreads, you truly have $175 at risk. Let's now talk about what might potentially happen with this bullish put credit spread that I've sold here. So there's really three options that could happen. The first one is the HPQ goes up in price. If that happens, we're able to get out of this position for a win. The second possible scenario is for HPQ just to kind of trade sideways. We see it had done that over the previous several weeks. Let's say continue to do that during the time we were in this trade. Well, we still could exit this position for a full potential win. Remember our position isn't challenged unless HPQ goes below that $29 put option that we've sold. Remember put options, when you sell them to someone, Somebody, you're selling someone else insurance. So you're not really in jeopardy unless that put option goes in the money. And that's the case if you hold it through expiration because all the extrinsic value or time value will deteriorate once you reach expiration day. Where this trade could say get in trouble will be if HPQ were to decline. Remember we've sold that $29 strike price put option and our break even since we receive 50 cents per share for selling that bullish put credit spread is $28.50 per share. So if HPQ were to decline to $28.50 per share and be there at expiration, then we end up with a break even trade here. But if it were to go beyond that and go below $28.50 per share, we're looking at a situation where we'd be showing a loss with this position. And in fact, if it declined all the way down here to $25 per share below that, we'd be showing max loss, which remember was $3.50 per share. So those are your three possible scenarios. The stock goes up, it goes sideways, or it goes down. Remember, it can do a combination of all of those during the life of this trade. And as the stock moves around, well, the value of this overall credit spread will also go up and down. What we do know is that expiration, the value of these options will be their intrinsic worth or how much they are in the money. So if they're out of the money, we walk away with 100% win. Always keep in mind that you can also close this trade early at any point before expiration. You don't have to wait until expiration day to close this trade out. When is it a good time to sell credit spreads? Let me share the details on why I sold this credit spread when I did. I like to sell bullish put credit spreads like I did here at HPQ when a stock has been experiencing increasing in prices over time. Here you see the line I've drawn dating back to October. Well, overall, we see HPQ is in a nice upward sloping trading channel. Here you see I've been following this kind of white line here and all that it had traded a Above it, it had come down multiple times over the previous month and found support at this upward sloping trend line. I now found that it was generally in that general vicinity around that trend line. And in fact, it had also found support around the green 50 and the red 200 exponential moving averages here on this chart. Because it was upward sloping trend line that had been finding support at for the past several months and the fact that it was finding support around these two moving averages, I felt comfortable selling that $29 strike price put option. So my favorite time to sell put options is when a stock is around support and preferably once it's showing that support is still holding. We see here that about two weeks before I did this trade, it had tested that area for support and it held. In fact, when you zoom into these legs here, to these three candlesticks here, so that every time it got close to this area, around these moving averages, buyers bought it back up. See, these legs tell us that sellers sold it down, but buyers bought it back up before the market closed. Same deal here the next day. Sellers sold it down, but buyers bought it back up. And again, this day here, sellers sold it down, but by the time the market closed for this stock, buyers had bought it back up. So on the day we did this trade here, which is this last candlestick, again, we see an instance where sellers sold it down. Now, it just so happened that by the end of this day, buyers didn't buy it back up, but we're still right around an area that has served as support for it multiple times over the previous weeks. That's what made me feel comfortable selling this bullish put credit spread against HPQ. And although I'm sharing with you a trade I did here as a bullish put credit spread, keep in mind you can't always do bearish call credit spreads. That's the reverse. When might you consider that? For example, we see here in this area around $31 per share, that seemed to be an area where HPQ was continually finding resistance. Every time it hit that area, sellers sold it back down. We see it back in here in December, again in January, then several times throughout March, and again in early April. When it reached that area of around $31 per share, sellers sold it down. So if you felt comfortable, you could do the reverse of what we did. Instead of doing a bullish put credit spread, you can do a bearish call credit spread. But I wanna give you a word of caution here 
when selling bearish call credit spreads. Just keep in mind that over time, the market and the situation, HPQ tend to go up in price. Now I've switched our chart over to a monthly chart. So you can see way back in time. This goes all the way back to 1985. But notice, although there's lots of ups and downs, and some of them really big ups and downs, overall HPQ goes up in price. When we look at the SP500, we see the same thing. Although we see lots of ups and downs or lots of waves, which is what I like to call them, overall long term, we see the market tends to go up. So you really want to keep that in mind if you're considering selling bearish call credit spreads. But an overall bearish market where the market and or a stock is going down in price, they might be worth considering. Another decision you have to make when doing a credit spread is how far out in time you're going to sell your options. Now, there's lots of opinions on this, but over the years I've found that I like to sell my options from 45 to 60 days to expiration. That's not set in stone, it is situation specific. I like to consider things like when its next earnings date will be because I don't like trading options through earnings if at all possible. But if there's no earnings date approaching, I generally like to sell my put options when they're about 45 to 60 days to expiration. That gives you plenty of time for the position to go in your favor and also for time decay or theta to eat away at the value of the option that you sold. And of course, a very important consideration is what strike price you will not only sell, but also your protective one that you'll buy. If you want to give yourself some more room to be wrong, for example, in this scenario, instead of selling the $29 put option, you could consider selling the $27 put option. That put you below all these lows over the previous months. And then instead of buying the $25 put option like I bought, you could buy a higher strike price to protect the put option. For example, you might consider buying the $26 put option. That would decrease how much you had at risk. If you sold this $27 put option as compared to the $29 put option that I sold, they'd be less likely this position would go against you. Just keep in mind that if you sell a $29 put option as compared to the $29 put option that we did, you'll receive less premium for that put option. Also, if you buy a higher protected put option, then that put option will cost you more money than a lower dollar one. So you just need to really think through and weigh the risk versus the reward, but always understand what you have at risk. And then always understand your potential reward. You might even want to look at the risk reward ratio. Remember the difference between the put option we sold at $29 and when we bought $25, that difference was $4. That meant we have $4 per share at risk. We receive 50 cents per share. So our risk to reward ratio was actually eight to one. A lot of traders like a better risk to reward ratio than that, but I was comfortable with it. You have to decide what risk reward ratio you feel comfortable with. It may be that you want a three to one risk reward ratio. If that were the case, then for every $3 you had at risk, you'd like to get a dollar per share in credit. So you just have to decide what risk reward ratio you're comfortable with. Another way to look at that risk reward ratio is that it helps you understand how many times you need to win in order for one maximum potential loss and you still break even. In the case of an eight to one ratio, I need to win eight times for each max loss or $4 loss for me to break even if I'm getting 50 cents per bullish put credit spread. And you see that because eight trades times 50 cents per trade equals our max loss of $4. So that's another way that some traders like to look at the risk reward ratio. Just keep in mind that as you sell these put options farther and farther out of the money, you get less credit for them. So the less you have at risk, the less your reward will be. How do you find these stocks or potentially good ones to trade credit spreads in? Well, here are four factors I really encourage you to consider. The first is the only trading stable, consistently profitable companies. I found that those high flyers, those very volatile stocks that most likely never turned a profit, well, they add a lot more risk to my credit spreads. So I like to avoid them. Only trading consistently profitable, stable, mature companies. Something else I like to look for is look for stocks that have recently experienced a decline but have found support and are bouncing off that support as you saw HPQ was doing. I also prefer to trade in stocks that I believe fundamentally are undervalued or at worst are fairly valued. I don't like to trade in companies that I believe are way overvalued. Third, when you're doing these credit spreads, try to avoid earnings. Earnings are very volatile and you never know what will happen through earnings. They may have a great earnings announcement, but the market hates it and the position goes against you or vice versa. So I always try to avoid earnings if at all possible. Finally, watch for stocks that are going ex-dividend during your expiration cycle. If you're selling a put option that expires in 30 days and it goes ex-dividend before then, just know that overall the stock will most likely drop in price at least initially on the ex-dividend date. So overall, I will trade options and stocks that are going ex-dividend during my expiration cycle that I'm selling. I do look at that, especially if I'm selling at the money put options. Next, how do you know when is the right time to exit or to close a trade. You can stand through expiration, but generally I don't do that. So when do you get out of a trade? First, let's talk about the losses. If you have a small account, you don't want to be taking maximum loss after maximum loss. You want to try and get out of positions where they go against you. So when should you do that? Well, it's really your decision. But one common concept is to get out as some multiple of the credit you received. For example, here in our HPQ trade, 
will receive 50 cents per share for this. So I could simply have a rule that if the position reached a max loss of 50 cents per share, then I would get out. Or you might have a 2x max loss. And if the position showed a loss of a dollar per share, that'd be your trigger to get out. But you wanna decide how much you're willing to risk before you exit this position for a loss. And here's an example of what I mean. This is a trade I'm in with the Russell 2000. Now this ticker symbol is RUT and it's 10 times IWM. So it's a lot bigger than what you'll probably be trading with a small account. But the concept is still the same. So you see that initially under average price, we received $2.92 per share for this or $292 because we did one contract of this bullish put credit spread. Well, what is my max loss for this position? Well, notice here that I sold the 1800 put and I bought the 1700 put for protection. So if we do the math, it's 1800 minus 1700. So we have $100 at risk per share. Multiply that times the 100 shares that each contract is worth, and we have $10,000 at risk. Now, I don't wanna lose $10,000 that we have at risk of this position if the Russell goes way down in price. So before I enter this trade, I set a max loss or an exit loss trigger. I received $2.92 per share for this trade. Since each contract is 100 shares worth, my max loss trigger is based on that. And it's three times what I received up front, or three times $292 or $876. If at any time my unrealized PL gets to negative $876, I close this position. That's one X loss trigger you can use when you trade credit spreads, some multiple of the credit you received up front. Going back to our HPQ example, if we use that same 3X multiple, we could say since we received 50 cents up front for this trade, multiply that times 3X, my 3X loss. If the trade is down $1.50 per share or $150 per contract, since each contract represents 100 shares, if this trade ever got to a point where it was losing $150 total, then I would exit the position. That's how you know when to exit if the position goes against you. Another exit loss trigger might be if the underlying stock reached a certain price. For example, my theory was that it should find support around $29. If that failed, now, I feel like it would definitely find support around $27.70 per share or the low from this day back at the end of February. And so I realized that I'd probably be totally wrong if it reached this $27 mark. So my ex-loss trigger might be if HPQ reached $27 per share, at that point, I knew I was totally wrong and I get out of this position. That'd be your exit if things went against you. But what about if they went your way? There's lots of theories on this and I'll share mine with you in just a minute. But the theory is that you should exit whenever you realize 30, 50, or more percent of your profit. Personally, I like to exit when I've realized a profit of around 80%. Somewhere in the 75 to 85% potential profit, if I've realized that, I generally tend to get out of them. And that's exactly what you see I did with this trade. Remember, we received 50 cents per share up front for selling this bullish put credit spread. If I stayed in until the point there's only 20% of the potential profit left, that meant I needed to exit when it was only worth 10 cents per share. So as soon as I entered this trade, I set an alert to remind me to close this position out early if the put option I sold is only worth 10 cents per share. As you see here on May 10th, we bought back some of those May 17th $29 put options for 10 cents per share. So we were able to close it out about a week early. There's one final exit consideration you might want to think about. That's to exit when it reaches a certain days to expiration. Some people like to exit positions or adjust them or roll them, linking down to about 20 days to expiration. So that's another one you might want to consider. It's not one I use a lot, but it is one that many people like to do. Now let's talk about managing your risk. Because risk management, although it's not the funnest thing to talk about, it is very important to talk about and to have a plan in place so you don't wipe out your account. You're just starting out here. If you have a large account, you want to keep playing this game. So you need to manage your risk. That's that's just a part of it. Everything we do in life pretty much has risk, so we manage risks all the time. Why not manage it with your trading account? So here are four important things to consider when it comes to managing your risk. The first one, especially when you're first starting out, is to keep your position size as small relative to your overall account value. And I suggest to keep your position sizes to around one to two percent over your overall account value. For example, let's say you have a $10,000 account. Well, at most, you wanna have 2% at risk in any one position. So you take $10,000 times 2%, that means you can have at risk in any one position using credit spreads, $200. Once you have more experience under your belt with trading options and trading credit spreads, you might consider increasing that, but still it's very important to have a max position sizing rule that you adhere to. So my personal rule is that initially when I enter a full position, I'll have at risk two to 3% of my overall account value. That leaves me an additional two to 3% of account value available to fix a position if it goes against me. But max, if I have a position that goes against me, I've maxed out my position sizing rule, then I have at most 5% at risk in any one position. But I encourage you, if you have a small account, if you're just starting out, have at most one to two percent at risk of your overall account value in any one position. Next, especially if you're just starting out, don't have 20, 30, 40 positions. Limit it to at most four to five positions. That'll allow you to really watch those trades, see how they respond to the ebb and flow of the market, and really keep an eye on them without being overwhelmed. Once you've been trading for a while, you can consider adding more trades, but starting out, 
Keep the number of trades you have open small. Third applies to how to handle ones that go against you. I have a lot of videos on how to adjust and fix positions that go against you. And one of the common techniques is to roll those positions. If you sold puts, roll them down and out. When you're first starting out, I'd encourage you not to do that. Set your exit loss trigger, and if a position goes against you, just get out. As you continue to educate yourself and try different repair strategies, you might consider rolling positions out to potentially improve the odds of winning, but initially, just exit position if it reaches your exit loss trigger. And third, don't stay focused on just individual trades. What I mean is think long term. You want to play this game forever. It's a fun, rewarding, and it can be financially beneficial game. But if you don't think long term, you think shorter term, you may begin to worry. And those emotions of fear and greed, they might affect your decisions. So really stay focused on long term. If you're just starting out, realize it'll take you a while to become a successful option trader. Just understand that up front and be okay with it. So think long term, an overall long term profitability. That'll help you make better decisions. If done properly, using credit spreads is a great way to grow small accounts. I encourage all of you to share your comments and thoughts on credit spreads in the comment section below. I try to respond to all comments at least a couple times a week, so please share your experience and any questions you have down in the comment section below. If you'd like to get an alert whenever we buy stock and sell options, check out the benefits of becoming a patron down at the link in the description below. As a new option trader, it's vitally important that you continue your education to help you become a successful long-term option trader. To see more details on credit spreads and how you can use them to be consistently profitable, check out the video series at the link above and description below entitled Credit Spread Option Trading. Until next time, happy investing, and we'll see you again soon.